A Bloomington man who creates virtual reality has made a whole new world for older adults. It's very interesting to see uh, an 80-year-old person who's never used a computer all of a sudden talking like a 12-year-old that plays Fortnite all the time. It's wonderful. Coming up on WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. Good evening, I'm Lauren Warnicky. Also on today's show, we'll honor some of the women educators who have shaped Bloomington Normal over the years. And if it were not for that type of outreach, I think Bloomington Normal would be much less, and certainly ISU would be much less than it is. And you'll meet one of the performers for WGLT's upcoming Highway 309 Live. And it has become very important to me to use my voice and my songwriting to represent women in my community. That's coming up after a Bloomington Normal news update. This is Sound Ideas on 89. WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR network. Support for WGLT comes from Bloomington Normal Audiology. Hear My Story continues with local patients Ralph and Carol Weisheit. I was actually going to add that that was one of the reasons that you went was because I kept saying, you're not listening to me. And she thought it was my hearing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See what I got to live with. <laughs> Ralph and Carol's full story can be found at bnaudiology.com. From the campus of Illinois State University in Normal, this is WGLT's news magazine, Sound Ideas. I'm Lauren Warnicke, in for John Norton. Virtual reality, or VR, has been the next big thing for a while, along with its cousin, augmented reality. Tech companies like Meta and Apple have made big investments for the future. Those currently using VR argue that the future is already here. And they say some of the best evidence is an emerging community of older adults who are using VR. WGLT's Ryan Denham reports on a new kind of senior center. Pat Parker is jumping up and down under the stars while wearing gigantic butterfly wings. Pat is 81 years old. Pat is part of an online community called Thrive Pavilion tucked inside the vast VR game called Meta Horizon Worlds. Dean Tudor from Bloomington helped create that community. It's for seniors like Pat Parker to help them stave off social isolation, meet other people, and just have some fun. It's very interesting to see uh, an 80-year-old person who's never used a computer all of a sudden talking like a 12-year-old that plays Fortnite all the time. It's wonderful. (laughs) Tudor is a creator, building the worlds that VR users explore and socialize in. I've made a whole slew of things from that senior community, a Star Trek world, um, an island uh, beach in the middle of an ocean. Um, I've made a space world where you can jump out of a spaceship into zero-g and fight each other. For Tudor, it's an unmatched form of personal expression, but he also sees it serving a greater good many older adults struggle with social isolation. And long before COVID, there's a small but growing body of evidence that VR could help. People see this as a gaming console, and it's great at being a gaming console. It really is. It's very impressive. But it's more of a communication tool, and that's what we're really getting into with this. Science is starting to show optimism, too. Ryan Moore is a researcher at Stanford's Virtual Human Interaction Lab, which studies virtual and augmented reality. Moore just did a study of hundreds of older adults in nursing homes and assisted living facilities, asking them how they felt after trying out VR. They really enjoyed it, and so did the caregiving staff. Many of the caregivers reported having conversations with the seniors about what they did in VR and how it connected to other things that they've done in their life, places that they've traveled, uh, animals that they they used to have. Older adults are not a monolith. A 65-year-old is a little bit different than a 95-year-old. And Moore's study found VR enjoyment tended to fade in older age. But there were indications that the leap to VR is less intimidating than, say, using a smartphone. When it's done right, it's very natural, right? If you want to get closer to something, you move your head. If you want to to grab something or to interact with something, you move your arm. Those ways that VR is kind of a natural extension of the way that we already interact with the offline world may make it a more natural medium. The conventional wisdom that older adults are not good with technology may be true for 2D tech like smartphones and tablets, which are built on abstractions. But VR world builder Robert Signori from North Carolina says an immersive 3D world is different. Like we're talking about the generation that like sent people to the moon, right? Invented color television and radio and and cars. They're great with technology. Signori created Thrive Pavilion, 
that community for seniors in Meta Horizon Worlds. His career was in software, including for retirement communities. Thrive launched about two years ago as a nonprofit. Think of it like a senior center. It's free with about a thousand members with about a dozen activities every week. There are monthly birthday parties, a book club, cards and games. And last Halloween, they had a party. The monster mash. It was a graveyard smash. They did the mash. Signori says hopefully there's something for everybody. The goal really is to build human connections and to uh, allow people to socialize uh, from home. There are barriers to more widespread VR use among older adults. The VR headsets are a few hundred dollars, at least. You need Wi-Fi, and it would be challenging for those with significant vision problems. We do have members that are bedridden or double amputees, you know, that are that participate. Some, some of the people that are bedridden um, or significantly wheelchair-bound, even outside of Thrive, this is how they get the majority of their socialization done. One of Thrive's community members is 66-year-old Elena Kay from Los Angeles. She doesn't drive and is living on limited funds with her 91-year-old husband. Then COVID hit. Then as the shutdown continued, <laughs> it was like, oh, I can't travel. I don't have my yoga center to go to anymore. You know, I started to feel a little stir-crazy. So she picked up VR. She logs on about three days a week, including visits to Thrive. She made friends in a women's group. And some of the women, I just started to just fall in love with their souls so much. Last summer, Kay visited a few of those VR friends in real life in England. You know, it's not a feeling of being separated from the rest of life when I'm in VR. It's just completely enhancing in both directions. And if all this catches on, people like Dean Tudor from Bloomington will be busy creating more worlds for more seniors. We have seen it turn around lives. We've seen it take people from, you know, barely holding on, essentially, to thriving. That's just why we call it Thrive. I'm Ryan Denham. Buying a headset is the big upfront cost to using VR. Meta Horizon Worlds is free to use, although other apps and games do cost a little bit of money. Coming up next week on Sound Ideas, hospitals can be a stressful place, especially for patients and their loved ones. You'll meet a few volunteers at Carl Broman who try to put people at ease through music. That's coming up next week. We've got the latest unemployment numbers in hand, also data on quits and job openings, breaking down the labor markets, as well as the rest of the week's economic news, next time on Marketplace. Listen to Marketplace beginning at 5.30 this afternoon on WGLT, sponsored by CEFQ. Two sociologists investigated why the bodies of hundreds of people end up at the Potter's Field of Los Angeles each year. This was not an easy book, but it was a book I felt had to be written. Pamela Prickett and Stefan Timmermans talk about their book, The Unclaimed. That conversation and the latest news Saturday on Weekend Edition from NPR News. Listen tomorrow between 7 and 10 a.m. on 89.1 WGLT. Voices from Gaza and Israel as Ramadan begins. Ukraine continues to fight. And a Texas chamber group looks at all that and more through the lens of music. Conflict and war and genocide is the ultimate forms of censorship. And this is testing the limits of free speech in many different ways. Sunday on Weekend Edition from NPR News. Listen tomorrow between 7 and 10 a.m. on 89.1 WGLT. This is Sound Ideas. I'm Lauren Warnicke. March is Women's History Month, and every weekday on WGLT, you've been hearing a new episode of a series we call 21 Women Who Shaped Bloomington Normal. This week is all about women whose impact can be seen in education. WGLT's Jack Polesnik has more. Educators come in all shapes and sizes, and in Bloomington Normal, there are many of them. With long-standing higher education institutions like Illinois State University and Illinois Wesleyan University, as well as more than a dozen schools for K-12 students, it comes with the territory. But some women stand out from the rest. Four in particular have shaped or are shaping Bloomington Normal Education for the better. Starting off strong in 1908 was Tompi Asher. She took the helm at the baby fold when it was just a few years old, long before it had established itself as the educational titan it is today in the area. 
Back then, it was just a home for abandoned children, and the conditions facing the new organization were bleak. The home was overcrowded and funds were tight. But current Baby Fold staff member Jill Riesenberg says those obstacles didn't deter Asher. She was lovingly known as Mother Asher. She wore a little power bun on her head, and she got to work every day. She didn't really know what weekends were. Asher became a regular in what was called downtown normal. People uh, recall seeing her going to the different merchants in downtown normal and asking for day-old bread, leftover produce, anything that could really help sustain the children. Asher remained superintendent for 27 years. Riesenberg says her hard work and the penny pinching helped establish the baby fold as a new organization and a solid force for good in the Twin Cities. And it really obviously transformed the lives of the orphans themselves, but also the health of our community. The original home she worked in no longer exists. It's now an ISU parking lot, but Riesenberg says Asher paved the way for what the baby fold is today. The nonprofit now serves hundreds of children and families through school programs, foster care and adoption services, and much more. Around a half a century later, and in Bloomington, there was Eva Jones. She was the first woman ever elected to District 87 school board. She was also the first person of color to make it there. This was in 1971, following increased racial tensions between black students and white school leadership. Jones brokered a peace. Charles Alsberry of Normal is a black community activist who considered Jones a political mentor. With Eva Jones, somebody was now sitting at the table. In 1976, Jones became District 87 school board president. Three years later, she was on Bloomington City Council, entering a new space again for the black community. Alsberry says Jones's legacy goes beyond being a first. She was an inspiration. That's why they got the first in front of her. It's not first because she's the first woman or the first African-American. She was the first to really inspire our community to do more unity together. Without a first like Eva Jones, though, there may not be women serving on District 87 School Board today. Jones paved the way for current members like District 87 School Board President Elizabeth Fox Anvik, a first in her own right. Fox and Vic's 2017 election made her the first openly gay candidate to win office in Bloomington. Visibility matters, right? I've had kiddos come up to me who just say, thanks for being on the board. When you can see yourself in a position where you want to be, there's always goodness that comes from that. Ann Vic wears many hats. She's a tech professional, a wife, a mother, and an LGBTQ plus advocate. Fox Anvik and her wife Caroline led the fight for same-sex marriage in Illinois. They also were the first same-sex married couple to be licensed foster parents in McLean County. Dave Bentlin, who heads the Prairie Pride Coalition, calls his fellow board member a sort of renaissance woman, helping across the community. Elizabeth is just a no-nonsense person. I mean, she looks at a situation and she sees what needs to be done, and she steps up and she does it. Higher education has also had its influential female leaders. One of them is Mara Toro Morn, who started teaching at ISU in the 90s. Since then, she's catapulted the school's Latino and Latina studies program forward. She's also encouraged local high schoolers to consider higher education with ISU and provided a welcoming environment for students, particularly international students and immigrants. Her colleague, Jim Pancrazio, says she's always trying to make students feel at home. And if it were not for that type of outreach, I think Bloomington Normal would be much less, and certainly ISU would be much less than it is. Toro Morn says she sees herself as un puente, a bridge between students and ISU, and the larger Bloomington Normal community. I see myself reflected in all of my students. I, I see myself reflected in their experiences in the classroom, in all of them. And women such as Toro Morn and Elizabeth Fox Anvik still have time to continue shaping the students they serve and the larger community. Perhaps one day they'll be recognized the same way as Tompi Asher or Eva Jones is. With reporting from Melissa Ellen, I'm Jack Palasnik. You can follow our series all month long at WGLT.org slash 21 women. Next week, WGLT will feature profiles of women in government and business. Stories and conversations from Bloomington Normal and across central Illinois, this is Sound Ideas. I'm Lauren Warnicke.
Hey, the next installment of WGLT's music concert series, Highway 309 Live, is coming up. Nashville singer-songwriter Chris Matthews is the headliner. The concert will be March 20th at the Normal Theater. Opening up for Matthews is Peoria's Sarah Marie Dillard of Sarah in the Underground. Dillard stopped by sister station WCBU's studios recently. There, she tells Jody Holt she's recently rethought how she describes the band. We used to describe ourselves as new and up and coming. (laughs) And I realized we'd been doing that for a few too many years. (laughs) So we have now moved into seasoned and established. And we're very proud to continue to bring to light the underground musicians of central Illinois. I gave my love to a coal miner to light his way. sits a lump of coal where once I found a heart. We feature upright bassist Brandon Mooberry, who also happens to be my husband. Uh, of course, we have me on the vocals and rhythm guitar, and I am the lead songwriter. And when we are able to perform as a full trio, we are proud to feature our friend Nick Fairley on the drums, but it's going to be really exciting to open for Chris Matthews as an acoustic duo with upright bass. Enough to keep And I never saw How long have you guys been, you know, kind of going around central Illinois and performing? I just looked up, I had a memory on Facebook. Eight years ago, Brandon and I were playing one of our first shows at the Apollo Theater downtown, and we were about to go on our first date. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> we didn't know it yet, but that okay. was about to happen. <laughs> I see. So it kind of sounds like the band, I mean, even kind of helped your relationship, brought you all together. It all happened on the same timeline for sure and was very much meant to be. In fact, Brandon was literally accepted to tour on bass with Cirque du Soleil right before I asked him to play bass for me. And for some uh, divine reason. <laughs> uh, he decided to stay in central Illinois, and we've been together ever since. Many men have come and gone, but I do believe you could carry on. You're playing with fire and smoke, but you keep telling yourself that the coals are cold. Well, you're not my type, but you're just my I would love to talk a little bit more about how you guys sort of describe or categorize your music as it relates to the idea of genre. Um, I saw you guys describe yourself as soul folk with a twist of jazz, and you often kind of play off of Peoria's jazz and folk roots. What does all of that exactly include and, and sort of mean to you guys? That's a great question, and of course, <laughs> ends up having a lot to do with branding. When we first formed, and it was my first band, I was so jazz. I was like, you know what? We're not going to choose a genre. We're going to make our own genre. <laughs> We're going to be so cool and inventive. And then we called it Soul Folk with a Twist of Jazz. Um, now that I've had a lot more experience with branding, I realize that's quite a few syllables to ask people to remember if they haven't heard of that genre before. So often we shorten it to Soul Folk. But when it makes more sense, we will uh, go under a broader umbrella of Americana or Indie. Um, I'm calling from the inside. Tell my father that I phoned You know I'm trying to come home Mama, I'm calling from the inside I can't sleep for these bad dreams Please say you still believe I'm not the madman that they show on the TV Well, it is Women's History Month, which is a prominent theme of our Highway 309 events. Um, So I kind of want to talk now about how you've seen your identity as a woman influence the type of music you create and maybe how it's even influenced how your band is viewed uh, within this larger central Illinois music scene. Our band has gone through a long journey of how we're viewed and it's ever changing, um, especially because we try not to be shy about things that are important to us. And that means that not everyone can be a fan. 
it's not just about our music. It's about how we conduct ourselves in the community. And I don't sleep on my community. I, I really like being a part of my community and being uh, firsthand involved in the creation of things that we can look back on in 50 years and say, hey, remember when that series started? Ah, and now it's the 50th anniversary. You know, mm-hmm. I want to build uh, the future that I'm going to look back on, and I want to know it's all going to be right here in Peoria. So while the things I started writing about in the beginning were quite lighthearted, they have gotten not only heavier, but also more meaningful. You know, not not all meaning has to be heavy. And it has become very important to me to use my voice and my songwriting to represent women in my community and who are in my community and who don't look like me and don't reflect my same life. I have sat in secret and begged for new desires Looking for a revelation But I had to leave the sanctuary to walk through the fire Cause silence never saved a people or a nation so You are, of course, opening for folk singer Chris Matthews from Nashville. Um, and Matthews notes that, you know, she hopes her music amplifies the voices of the unheard, sheds light on the unseen, and serves as a steadfast reminder that hope and love are the truest pathways to equity and justice. So as a fellow artist, as her opener, give me your thoughts on all of that. You know, how does it feel to be the opening act for Chris? And ultimately, what do you hope audiences take away when they listen to your music? I am very proud and honored to be selected as Chris's opening act. Of course, Chris is from Nashville, and I like to call Peoria the next Nashville. (laughs) So we kind of got like a little (laughs) national Nashville party going on. Um, Those words that she uses to describe her music ring true for me through every bone and fiber and even to reaches the little Mm -hmm. girl in me and says, oh, I'm opening for the right person. I very much share those desires, and I hope that my lyricism especially can be used to uh, create a voice for the voiceless. Will you find perfect peace? joys never cease somewhere beneath the stars. Sarah and the Underground open for Chris Matthews at Highway 309 Live. That free concert is March 20th at the Normal Theater. Sarah Marie Dillard spoke to WCBU's Jody Holtz. Support for arts and culture coverage on WGLT comes from PNC Financial Services. PNC is committed to supporting local arts and culture events in the communities they serve. Thanks for choosing WGLT's Sound Ideas on this International Women's Day, made possible in part by Bloomington Normal Audiology. I'm Lauren Warnicke. Story help today came from WGLT's Ryan Denham, Jack Pelesnik, and WCBU's Jody Holtz. Ryan Tui edits the show. You can find all our Sound Ideas interviews and stories at WGLT.org, and you can subscribe to Sound Ideas on the NPR app or wherever you get your podcasts. We want to know what you think of Sound Ideas. Go comment on our Facebook page. That's at WGLTFM. Or you can find us at WGLT News on Instagram and Threads. This is 891 WGLT and WGLT.org, part of the NPR network.